All right, everyone. So, so um, we are about to get started now. I'd just like to request if everyone could please keep their microphones muted um, so that we don't have any background noise coming through um, and keep your cameras off too. Um, David Holm will keep his camera on and he will present his slides. Um, so yeah, for those of you um, who don't know, So sorry for that. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Jared Rodnick. I'm the co-president of the UNSW Architecture Society. Um, and we're very glad to be partnering with Cox and the David tonight to present this talk. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Adib, who is a uh, former executive of the Architecture Society and currently works at Cox. And he's going to introduce you all um, to Cox, who they are, and also to David. All right, thanks for that, Jared. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Adib and I'm tonight's host. As some of you know, I am a student of the UNSW Architecture Program and I'm also currently working in Cox Architecture as a student designer. We are a contemporary multidisciplinary practice with multiple studios across major cities like Melbourne, Adelaide, Dubai, Canberra and Sydney. And it was Philip Cox, as many of you may know, who originally founded this practice. However, nowadays he's a consultant and it is led by multiple directors. Tonight, we have David Holm, one of our fantastic directors from the Sydney office. And as an architect, urban designer and director here at Cox, his designs focus upon the nexus of urban infrastructure and public placemaking in the city. Having worked on a multitude of projects from the Northwest Rail Link to the Barangaroo Ferry Hub and all the way to the likes of New Delhi International Airport, just to name a few. David is also adjunct professor of the Design and Architecture Faculty at UTS and is a former New South Wales Architecture Board um, Registration Examiner. Put quite simply, tonight's talk aims to take you inside the studio and explain how exactly our practice runs. David will also run through the studio design process, the design development, as well as what directorship exactly involves, and more specifically, how our team structures work. So feel free to relax, grab yourself some snacks and have a drink as we take you into the studio. I'd like to now hand it over to David. Thanks, Jared, and thanks, uh, Deb. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here presenting to the University of New South Wales Architecture Society this evening. So thank you both and all of you very much for coming along and spending your valuable time. Hopefully we'll have some questions at the end of this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to quickly add, I forgot to say, if anyone has any questions throughout the talk, you're more than welcome to type them in the chat. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session that the Deb will be moderating, so we will read out your questions to David. Off you go, David. Thanks, Jared. So my name's David Hall, um, and I'm very pleased tonight to discuss some aspects of how Cox, especially our Sydney studio, functions, and hopefully that will be of interest to you. Um, I'm going to do that from a personal point of view. We in Sydney have 12 directors and, at the present point, 220 staff. So everybody who comes in and, and works and collectively participates will have their own view. So tonight is my view, and... and um, We'll be happy to discuss that and analyze that and understand that. Currently, I'm on Durubbin land, and I'd like to acknowledge the Karingai people on the land that I am standing at the moment and recognize their leaders, past, present, and emerging. And I guess that really places a thread of what we feel and what I feel is important about country and place and context, really, as being some of the backbone points of how we develop our work. What I thought that I would do is to start a little bit <clears throat> and just give you a, a, a personal architectural history of, of some of my work as well. I'm a, a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Technology, um, originally born on um, Camilleroy land, so a country New South Wales boy coming to the bright lights of the city to study architecture. And then I went on and I think importantly had a couple of years break 
before um, going back again to University of Technology in Sydney to do a master's degree, which is quite separate to a lot of the way that the study structure is at the moment. So two very separate degrees. And I thought that that separation was important to throw a bit of life in the middle of that mix as well too. Um, I was lucky enough to spend quite a few years at a company called Woodhead and some key projects there uh, led me really, I guess, into the public realm. And that's really where my uh, career has luckily rested in pursuit of public architecture. And what you'll start to see then is I've been at Cox uh, almost 10 years now, and I've been lucky enough to really work on projects that sit within the public realm. Many of those are in infrastructure and transport. And what has become a particular pattern, and I think it's interesting for younger students certainly to observe, is that many of those projects, and I had no uh, understanding of this, but for example, the one that I put up there, Changi Terminal 3, where our role was that of the interior architect, we were commissioned in 2000, the building opened in 2010. Um, so many of these projects that we're now working on have these enormously long gestation periods. So it calls, I think, for a particular kind of architect, it calls for a particular kind of an approach to the way that you may work and the way that you contemplate your ideas, which hopefully tonight I'll be able to unfold some of those sort of personal thoughts of mine and then also the way that Cox and our Sydney studio approach some of those practices as well. So to understand a little bit of the Cox history uh, is important, we think. As I did mention earlier on, the practice itself was established really in another eon by uh, Philip Cox in 1964 and really quite typically of that time and that era, it was that of a, a patriarchal firm, a patriarchal structure. And what we've done to date in that period over, over many directors and, and many thousands of people who've gone and either come through the firm and stayed or come through the firm and gone on to other uh, pursuits with, the, with their architectural background is that now that we call ourselves a collective collaborative. And that's the way that we like to think that, that we work at the moment. I think the things that prevail though that are deep with Philip Cox's um, philosophical thinking are the ideals of Australia and interestingly as a young graduate uh, when it was quite popular for people to go and do the grand tour and travel to uh, usually London and Europe and to sort of see all the architectural wonders pre-internet that we only had ever seen in books Philip's idea was to try and understand Australia and to understand that sense of place and he, he did produce a couple of books that came out of that as well too and he went to Papua New Guinea and travelled around there and really tried to understand what it was that made Australia different to the rest of the world. Our, our full company uh, at the moment, we've chosen to retain an Australian base. And we've chosen when we do operate internationally to reach out and when we do reach out, we collaborate. So all of those projects that you'll see that are there outside of Australia, we've achieved with outside collaborators from those places. And the purpose of that is that we think that it's impossible for us to actually understand the depth and the knowledge of those places, perhaps in the same way that we understand or try to understand Australia. In the reverse, what we also do, and I was just trying to um, assess today, I think at the moment in our Sydney studio, we have something like about 10 active collaborations with international firms who are coming into Sydney, in this particular case, to work on projects with us. We do that very much in a... Uh, an embracing manner and we do it neither wherever we travel as a master servant or a servant master situation we always try and make it a collaboration and a true meeting of minds and we find that that's the best way to work in a design sense uh, both in Australia and internationally. So that choice to stay in Australia we have <clears throat> in Australia we have six current studios at the moment and I think inter interestingly enough um, and I did mention that we do have a small studio in the Middle East, but that really has been born out of our Perth studio and our Adelaide studio was born out of Melbourne as well too. So they were originally reach outs where we've then established ourselves in those places um, coming from that core culture. We have 43 directors that are aged somewhere between about 33 years of age and 72, and that's a really conscious um, divestment of age and it's a really conscious divestment of gender um, and ethnic mix as well. That's an evolving thing and it's obviously a very topical issue throughout um, architecture in Australia and it's something that large firms like ours are addressing um, quite aggressively and it should be to get towards an equality, if you like, of thinking across the broader practice. 
overall, our business structure is probably not unique, but we think that we have some particularities as well. We have what's called a board of management, and that's comprised of um, six directors and in an egalitarian fashion that one of those comes from each of our branches. And we have a couple of independents that sit on the board as well too. Um, they meet monthly and they talk about those issues that are spelled out through their aspects that are affecting the broader practice. The grassroots up approach that we take there is that each of those issues are then uh, discussed in depth in each of our studios as well too. So whilst our particular representative, um, which is a lady called uh, Alex Small in Sydney, takes those issues to the national forum, what we then do in our particular Sydney situation is that we take uh, all of those issues, the finance and the governance, the design, marketing, communications, IT, productivity, international and investment, they are all discussed at that local level with a particular application to the Sydney culture, the Sydney marketplace and those 220 people that are currently within our practice as well. What we'll try and do on a day-to-day -day basis is to assign people who are interested in those particular tasks and have expertise in those to actually apply themselves to that. So, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense from, a, from an interest point of view. So to drill into that a little bit, <clears throat> from the Sydney practice point of view in a further distillation. We assess things almost on a daily basis. We have a team of people who look at issues in the finance and governance, uh, which is a growing area in our industry that, you know, a lot of the projects that we are involved in in our Sydney studio probably range from at its smallest two to three million dollars if, if it's a particular project that we're keen on working on through to multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects. In that area, we have to assess such things as contracts, which are evolving, um, legal issues, there's quality assurance, and there's a plethora of issues that are just about organising the projects and the practice and making sure that that uh, delivery is done in a smooth and a seamless manner. The next aspect there, design, marketing, and communications, really is three quite discrete strands. From a design point of view, we always will endeavour to have a design inception meeting. So as a project comes into the office, we often sit around, we have Fridays are dedicated in our practice uh, that they're, they're aligned for. And it's been interesting over the last three or four months is that they now happen uh, on Zoom electronically, that we continue with our design reviews. So projects from inception, and we'll even work through as projects develop onto particular aspects. Last week, we were reviewing one project with the design of an awning and how the water was going to be moved through to the gutter of that uh, particular situation. So the idea is a whole of life design interrogation that can occur from sighting right through to detailing. And we hopefully try and uh, express that with our staff as much as possible. The design is not something that finishes at a concept point, but it actually continues right through to the site architect working on site and discussing those issues, you know, with the contractor to actually achieve the design ideals that were set out in the origin. IT and productivity, uh, key issue there because, again, as practice is evolving, we find now that our delivery teams uh, having to deliver on projects something upwards of a 1,000 odd drawings on particular projects, whereas maybe 10 years ago that might have been a tenth of that. So the complexity of actually uh, doing documentation, delivering that productivity, we're only seeing that increasing. And what we're seeing is that we now have particular staff whose role it is to actually upload documents, make sure they're correctly layered, correctly organised as well. And again, making sure that that can happen is really part of the overall design process. We put international there as well too, because we are lucky with our <clears throat> various broad networks to be requested to work on projects internationally. And what it brings when you operate outside your jurisdiction is unfamiliar territory that may mean uh, that the law is different, that the, the codes that you work under are different. So we'll have a group and we have a group in Sydney that when those requests come in that they are triggered and they're dealt with in a manner that we say, do we want to do this work? What kind of risks do we think are associated with that? To actually understand is it something that can enhance our reputation and can we in turn then enhance um, the outcome as a design outcome for that particular community or client that we may be working with. This probably has too fine a text for you to read, but <clears throat> what you can start to interpret there is a layout structure of our Sydney practice. And this is something that we keep up to date because we just try and like to understand how people are organized in our practice on a day-to-day -day basis. As I mentioned, 
we in Sydney have 12 directors. Our spread of age is um, between 39 and 72. We've organised ourselves into clusters, and you can see there, there are six clusters. They're not all the same size. They are not all the same composition. And indeed, many people move around laterally from one cluster to another cluster based on work. Each of those clusters has a variety of work, although there are some elements of uh, typologies that do start to sit in, with a particular skill set of knowledge in those clusters. The purpose of the cluster arrangement for us was to, rather than have a, a practice that was made up of a series of projects, was to actually, if you like, have a series of homes so that people find that their cluster groups, um, they meet on a weekly basis and they talk about all sorts of things, often outside the project, often outside the practice. Um, they're almost like this sort of more familial situation. Our original idea was that those clusters could and should be in the order of about 25 people. And you can sort of see that, that some are in that form, but some have been successful and grown beyond that. And that's, that's kind of life. And we're currently having discussions about whether those clusters need to, in fact, uh, break and try and achieve that model 25 people as well too as a particular uh, social grouping as such. The key thing is that it's a collection of personalities and it's a collection of views as well. And as I said at the onset, uh, if you speak with anybody else in the 220 group of Cox, they'll have a different view of where they fit in that cluster arrangement. We've again chosen that our studio is in the Sydney CBD. Interestingly enough, again, during the events of the last four months, we've, as a directorate, our, our directorate meets on three occasions during every week at different times during the week and to discuss different matters. Sometimes they're project matters. Sometimes we, we have another meeting where we're not allowed to discuss projects, but we only discuss issues. Um, so the idea is that we get together on a very regular basis and try and run through what we think is the health of our practice and the ongoing uh, trends or ideals that we'd like to uh, contemplate. One of those at the moment is how will we work in the future? And I'll touch on that a little bit further. The idea very much with our studio at the moment though, is that it is city based. We feel that that's important given the kind of work that we do in the public realm and the people with whom we work with collaborators. What's interesting in our particular Sydney studio is that we're based around a town hall concept. And so within that town hall, it's a gathering place. It's a meeting place. It's open, it's egalitarian. When you come out of the lift, you can see in that space. So quite often you'll be sitting there having a meeting and another client or another set of friends will come in the doors and that's open. It's, it's not meant to be secretive in any way. We do have places where you can uh, have, if you like, more discreet meetings. But the idea is that what we're doing is, is very much like a, uh, you know, a, it's, a, it's a studio, it's a making laboratory. What we're doing is actually live and you can actually see how the work is being curated. What we think is interesting is that across our <coughs> spread of studios, they are not intended to be the same, but they do have uh, like qualities. So Melbourne, for example, and Brisbane and Adelaide and Perth all have this sort of um, town hall quality. And you can see the image there in the top centre, which is our Melbourne practice. They're in formal gatherings or indeed formal gatherings, similar to what we'll have in our Sydney studio as well too. So the cultural threads and the DNA that bind us together um, are really about sharing and egalitarianism and the way that we can actually communicate both within our studios, but then also connecting our studios to get the best of a large practice across, in this case, Australia. To then contemplate a little bit about our ethos and, and what things mean to us and, and how we actually reflect upon our work. Some of what I'm about to talk to you, structure, craft and nature, is an ideology that uh, tends to bind our thinking. It is somewhat reflective and it is also collective in a sense. We in the Sydney studio have another mantra which overlays this and we feel that the city of Sydney is our project. So when we do urban projects, we, we will immediately zoom out and try and understand where does it fit in the city? What are the nearby contextual issues, roads, freeways, waterways, rail lines, etc., And then zoom in to try and understand what are the particularities of context. And again, that's very much, a, if you like, a vestige of Philip Cox's influence, which is about structure. So structure is not necessarily steel and concrete. Structure is how a city is made, how a city is assembled, what are the arterial formats and granularity of the city structure itself? So to that end, 
we're quite intrigued by the idea of um, structural expression. We'll always look for uh, ways that structure can actually be never hid. We always think that, you know, the average person should be able to almost read a structure and understand how that, that sort of gravity can come and, and make ground as such as well. We, we find that there's benefit in that because when you have dialogue in structure, you're usually talking to a structural engineer and others, but you have dialogue about the weight of structure. <clears throat> that can be something that's very productive when you're liaising with consultants and contractors to try and get towards what are lightweight structures, uh, often more cost effective. And what you'll see there quite purposely on the left hand two images are you know, much more traditional um, Australian forms of vernacular, finding Australia, finding you know, where we are, where we come from. And that was very much born in the idea of um, you know, doing more with less and, and making do as a, a new uh, European nation in that sense. Um, we didn't have many materials, so you really had to basically make what you had work very hard. And we think that's a key Australian disposition. On the right hand side, show some of the explorations um, the, the the bottom one there is the uh, Chinese National Maritime Museum. The top one, Dunlop AMI Park in Melbourne. Again, both achieve using really lightweight expressions of steel um, that give a poetry of form as well. So again, we're always looking for structure, and structure, as we said, can be found in buildings and also in urban situations as well. We're intrigued by craft and. I guess we're probably equally intrigued by the loss of craft as well. So what we do try and incorporate into our work is a richness so that again, as the every man uses a building facility, there are perhaps quirky details or interpretations or uses of material done in a uh, often macro format. We often work on large you know, projects, so they often have to be of a uh, economical format but there's a richness in the way that they're assembled and the richness, the way they're made. They're so actually celebrating the making of materials and uh, how they're actually assembled so that people can get that sense of joy and understanding how things are put together. In addition to that, art is important to us as a collective. We'll often work collaborative, collaboratively with artists. Um, at the moment, for example, on the project that um, I'm lucky enough to be involved in the new Western Sydney Airport, we're working with a curator who is looking backwards at some of the Indigenous reflections, how to then move them forwards as an interpretation into our work. But then in the contextual situation of Western Sydney, which if you look at Australia, which is one of the most multicultural cultural countries in the world, Sydney is probably its most multicultural city. And of Sydney, Western Sydney is probably the most multicultural part of Sydney. What we're trying to express is what will that multiculturalism in that Western Sydney place be expressed as in a body of artwork. Interestingly enough, in that particular project, which will open in 2026, we're contemplating artworks and art programs that might be starting to be incorporated now and then could be there uh, and ongoing in 2026 and then ongoing programs. So it's a long diagram and it's understanding in this, in this particular case of Western Sydney Airport, that sense of place and Aboriginality in Australia, but then also the future of multiculturalism and how you might interpret that into a new place as well. The final uh, ethos point that we have is that of nature. And I think many architects find their uh, origin or indeed their calm in nature and I'm no different. And our practice shares that view as well. We certainly see nature as an inspiration, but it's also a, a workshop and a place of learning where you can understand how structure works. You can also understand um, gravity and materiality as well. Um, for example, again, the Western Sydney Airport that I'm working on at the moment, one of the ideas for that was as a metaphor, um, why couldn't we make this building feel like you're walking through a dry sclerophyll forest that you would find in the common plain? So the last 12 months of my life, one aspect certainly has been exploring how do we get light to move through a roof and to fall onto a floor that might express those light qualities in the end architecture that then engages us with lighting designers from Europe, uh, climatic designers, structural designers as well. So these ideas that are formed often in nature and find their place uh, through a rich collaboration of people uh, and projects. So I'll maybe highlight some of those projects as well that, that exemplify some of this thinking. 
I think really, as I've started to touch upon, the key elements that we're focused on, and I certainly am as well, is that of public place and creation of public place. We have a situation in Australia, certainly, and, and I think worldwide as well too, that historically, public place was provided by the public purse. That is evolving and you will still find that public places are provided by governments, but you will also find the blurred line where public places are being provided uh, in the private realm as well. And how do we then handle that to ensure that it's always open when you need it to be open? Um, get to communities in that sense, but it's a pursuit of public life and public place and that vitality that comes with that. The second element that I think is a threat is, is that of context and the pursuit of sense of place and how do we actually get the essential qualities of what a place is, what it means, what are its materials and what are its opportunities. We were certainly very proud last year um, that the Ulara Resort at Ayers Rock received the Institute of Architects 2019 Enduring Architecture Award. I think the things that stand out about this particular project are its remoteness, and it's quite possibly one of the most remote places in the world. And the key thing that probably rides above that is that it's largely self-sustaining. Uh, if you think about where it is, there's really no pipes in the pipes out. So when we talk about sustainability, this project was one of the pioneers of how to actually catch water, find water, catch water, hold water, and then it goes on from that elements as well too. So with a, a limited on-site population and then a, a fluctuating uh, visitor population, this project now some 30 years on, stands the test of time as a sustainable place in what is a you know, quite difficult uh, climatic situation. In a completely different uh, urban environment, the King Street Wharf project in Sydney in the 1990s uh, was part of I guess, Philip Cox's expression, again, of a blurred Australian facade. So if you think about the idea of a veranda and the role of the veranda, you know, when the European settlement came out, they bought their um, they bought the European kind of houses with them, and they were in summer and too cold in winter. So one of the first things that happened was the application of the veranda style of an architecture that actually ameliorated some of those uh, climatic situations. This project is a contemporary example of this of trying to sort of delaminate, if you like the public and the private uh, hard line. So when you go down to this space, even now some 25 years on, the areas that are public uh, are private, such as the restaurants, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. And we like that. We think the good streets, in fact, are the ones where those lines are actually blurred and we can actually have that sort of sense of feeling as if you're in a, a mid zone, you're not being threatened to sort of enter, you're not being threatened to leave, but you're in this idea of a you know, quality public place where those blinds are indeed purposely blurred. Next one, which I touched on earlier is the AAMI uh, stadium. And the reference really here is about a lightweight structure and dealing in a design and construct situation, what you'll have is a, a, a contractor quite often um, giving you pressure to you know, reduce costs. And what this project was able to achieve was a, a really hardy structural outcome that served its purpose as a, in this case, a rectangular football field, but it also then created a presence of an urban memorable form as well. So um, cheap doesn't necessarily mean that the aesthetics have to suffer. And I think that's something that we kind of enjoy is that idea going back to what I was saying about doing more with less is that achievement of the sort of balance between uh, projects that are that are memorable from a public point of view, but also achieve, if you like, some of the broader practice outcomes of finances and budget as well. On a similar basis in Singapore, and we've been lucky enough over the years to, to do a number of projects in Singapore, primarily around Marina Bay, where we were the master planners. This particular project, the Helix Bridge, explored back to that nature idea, uh, Crick and Watson's idea of the DNA and how we could actually use that as a metaphor for the structure to make this very, very light structure that actually moves its way from one side of the bay across to the other. And that's got glazing protection that's in there. And it's one of the great sort of public connectors within Singapore. So back to that reference of nature and using structure as lightly as you possibly can. The next one is uh, again, much closer to home at the University of Wollongong and it's a sustainable building research center. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on. One of the key things about this project is that a little bit like what I was saying earlier on, 
the, the length of projects is, is now anything between three to 10 years. This project really came about uh, not only by us as architects and Joe Aegis was the project director for this and designer, but it's the relationship now uh, with the occupier and it continues, it continues to this day. So we probably technically finished our work on the project some three or four years ago, but Joe is still in constant contact with the client, measuring the building and measuring the facility and understanding uh, the qualities of this uh, as a sustainable outcome. This next one, Chatswood Station, is seen within the Sydney realm as being one of the first transit-oriented developments uh, that have been able to occur within the Sydney context. What's quite interesting about this, and, and really it happens the world over, is that the invention of the railway some 250 years ago was a fantastic invention that obviously changed the world and the way that we live in the world. What it did though in uh, urban, suburban communities around the world was often to divide. And you know, you hear from the most comical comments, or oh, they're from the wrong side of the tracks or the other side of the tracks. The, the rail itself actually split cities and split suburbs. And Chatswood in this particular case was no different. You had in Sydney's situation, a ridge road um, which is one of the primary roads. Many of the roads in Sydney are ridge roads, such as Military Road in the north, and in this case, the Pacific Highway. And running quite parallel to the Pacific Highway um, for most of its distance as you head north up towards um, Karingai in the north of Sydney is the Northern Rail Line as well. And so what had happened was that both the Pacific Highway and the Rail Line divided the suburb into two. What you'll see on the centre image there, if you scrutinise that a little bit, mid left is the train. And what we were able to do working with our clients was to actually create that connection where people now come in off one street and there's a, there are a series of topographical conditions. People now come in and underneath the train line and move through. So if you like, the suburb was stitched back together again and where the suburb was, if you like, broken by the rail lines and was seen very much as a barrier, this particular project was able to actually create a new focus. Around that focus was established um, eating and, and certainly many people go there now to actually gather at the place as opposed to being um, seen as a barrier there. So it's created as a, a new community gathering around the railway station and that urban connection has been one that sort of fixes really uh, one of those sort of tragedies, I guess, that occur, you know, via the rail system where they do carve often our suburbs in two. So it's a really important project from an urban design point of view and understanding what the urban issues are. In a similar project, and this is one of mine from a few years ago in Sydney Airport, is that what we we're looking to try and achieve, if you like, was the equivalent of a great outdoor Sydney space as people were leaving to go and uh, embark on their, their travels. So a departing passenger would experience this space. One of the great things about Sydney and indeed Australia is the quality of light that only when you travel do you realise that our light is so crisp and, and so clean in its colour. So this project was very much about trying to express that light and, and we explored different ways of trying to do that. In again, what was a, a large span structure, it's about a 50 metre by 50 metre structure overall. And because we were operating in an airport environment, we only actually had, well, we, the builders, the contractors, only had access to the site from 3 a.m. after all the curfews closed down to approximately 6 a.m. in the morning. So to actually be on site for that very, very limited period of time, much of the design was influenced to be a prefabricated structure. So out of this was born this long span structure, 50 by 50 metres, and much of it was made off site, not on the airport, and then craned into position. What we were able to then achieve is this sort of lighter weight uh, form and then you'll see again this idea of the way that the light then is cutting down onto the floor. So we're getting patinations that are occurring uh, that are much like an outdoor environment. And this is the, the space that people dwell in here as a public place, like, a, like an Italian piazza or such, prior to their final leaving of Australia in this situation. Again, just recently, and to mark the centenary of World War I, we were lucky enough to be commissioned for this project, uh, Sir John Monash and for Villas Bretagne in France. And what it really represents, and we're, we're currently also doing an upgrade, a major upgrade to the Australian Museum uh, in Sydney. This, this form of museum, if you like, represents a new typology of how do we, how do we, how do we memorise our history? 
it's very much digital. It's a bringing to place. It's the importance of place. And this is uh, based around Lutchen's uh, iconographic work here in the fields of Villa Bretagne. So the idea is when you are visiting here, you're immersed in what is now a digital experience that brings back the memory of place and the memory of that experience. So if you like, it's a new age form of museum and commemorating our culture. Another one of my projects <clears throat> just finished uh, a year or so ago was the Brangaroo Ferry Wharf Precinct. We were very conscious that uh, building on Sydney Harbour comes with a, a great degree of responsibility. You don't, don't get that very often. We've been lucky since to uh, be involved in a series of the new contemporary ferry forms that are now sort of occurring around the harbour. So we wanted to try and look at a building that was an extension of the urban place and again to blur that line between a hard edge situation of being on land and if you like on sea, on water. So we did everything we did with our client in the situation transport for New South Wales to try and blur that line between where ticketing is placed. And they're quite prosaic things, but we felt it was important to, to try and understand that as people were embarking and disembarking, uh, that that sense of connectivity to land was quite important. You'll see that there's, a, in this case, a variety of functions that are held in those low-level forms, um, ranging from really diverse things like fire hose reels and um, solage pumps through to offices and ticket gates. We wanted to try and um, work those into a geomorphic form that represented, if you like, the lower landscapes of Sydney's uh, various headlands but then look to a curvaceous form that would sit above that and floats above that area, still giving the passengers protection, but not allowing, if you like, some degree of interpretation of what is a curved language that's seen to be in a simile with Sydney Harbour. Moving right away now is another project that just finished last year, and that's the new National Maritime Museum of China. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, we won this in competition. And it was an open competition from the world to put forward, which is quite typical, that you will be asked to put in expressions of interest. Um, we did that, and I think we were shortlisted to about six for a paid competition. Again, we had local parties with whom we worked right up uh, to the current times. And this project took about six years from inception to fruition. Originally conceived by Philip Cox as this transition between uh, land, people and water, the idea was these fluid forms really were the, they were, they were neither land forms nor water forms. And within here were housed the various artifacts that uh, the Chinese sea nations were bringing back to land as well too. So this idea of, of technology uh, transfer as well is a really key issue. How do we, when you draw these sort of soft elements in either watercolor or hand drawings, how are they then achieved in these complex forms is something I'll touch on a little further. The current project that, that we're running and I'm involved in is part of the new Sydney Metro system. So the Metro will be opened in 2024. And this is Victoria Cross Station in North Sydney. And it's, it's an interesting project in many respects. You'll see by this little axonometric that on the right hand side is the southern entry, which is down on the corner of Berry and Miller Streets. And above that is a, a new office building form that will be built as part of the development. So you're seeing these really complex urban projects that are uh, similar to Chatswood, where you're having these high rise developments built on top of, uh, in this case, rail infrastructure, really creating a new, uh, in this case, North Sydney. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand what was North Sydney. It has some interesting uh, physical constraints. It actually tilts, if you like, southward. So it struggles with sun, uh, not enough sun, and it struggles with wind, too much wind. So a lot of the work that we did in creating place was to really try and express that the entrances around the railway station were new safe places to try and interpret those as places where you would actually have a water spend time. Nor in this particular case has a, a paucity of public place. So we've actually set the whole building back off Miller Street in this case, so that during the middle of the day, it actually has a, you know, a, a commodious quality that people will come and spend their lunch times there on Miller Street. And then as they move down the railway station experience itself, what we've tried to do is really to demonstrate the efficiency of travel. So it's 
It's uh, it's a very refined right. process. We made it that it's smooth, it's easy. One of the words that Transport for New South Wales use is that the transport experience throughout Sydney should be easy. And it's a, it's a good point because often, you know, when you're moving in a transport situation, it's not easy, it's complicated, it's difficult to find your way around. So we, we keep trying to comb our way through the transport processes here to make them as actually as easy and as smooth as possible. The little north entrance there, I guess just demonstrates the complexity of some of these projects because the north entrance actually pops up in amongst a series of uh, heritage buildings near the North Sydney Council Chambers that are buried in what you might call that lower North Shore crow's nest style of architecture that, that speaks of the early 20th century, um, somewhat Edwardian Victorian. So in really three or four blocks, the character changes in North Sydney very, very quickly from a commerciality to what is almost a, a granular, uh, almost residential scale. So you can see the materials that we've spawned with there are brickworks and uh, metals that are, that are sort of, of that coloration and of that sort of um, detailing of that particular area. So I think this project really demonstrates some of the complexities that you do find uh, in context and then also in function that can occur uh, in practices like ours. The next project uh, that I'm showing you is again one that I've mentioned already and it's one of mine that, that I'm working on at the moment is the new Western Sydney Airport in Sydney and it's scheduled for opening in 2026. And we've probably got a team of about 40 to 50 people that are working on this at the moment. We are in collaboration with Zaha Adid, uh, based out of London, and they equally have a similar amount of people both um, operating in London and in Sydney. And I think what's interesting about this perhaps is a, again, thing on purpose to tonight's topic is to talk a bit about practice, is that their practice director and I met at a conference in 2015. Um, he was very interested to talk about what had been mooted and it's been a, a long discussion in the um, Sydney industry, the new Western Sydney Airport. And so we talked to each other possibly for about six months or so about would it work, could it work? Um, how would the two practices come together? And we talked about, as I mentioned before, that you know, we, we certainly at Cox are not interested in any master-servant relationships. It would have to be a true meeting of minds. So what we decided to do was to bid for the project exclusively. This is before the bid had even come out. So we organised a memorandum of understanding uh, of how we would work together and what we would do when and if a bid were to come out. This was probably during 2016, 2017. The bid came out in 2018 and what typically happens in these situations that we find, and it's a good thing is you, based on friends that you've worked with before or other kind of networks, you often try and make uh, different arrangements quite quickly to understand how you might work together or what different sort of groupings that you might work. And in some cases, it might not be uh, too, in this situation, large firms. What we often will do as well too is to work with very, very small firms. We've done competitions with some local city firms that are four, five, six, ten people. And again, we still take that same attitude that we come to the table as equals. We might put more people into it, but the intellectual property and the ownership is done as an equal situation. So what happened when the project was released is that with Zaha's office and ours, we were ready to go. We were basically absolutely organised and we sort of hit the ground running. And we felt that that was a great advantage. So there was a, a worldwide expression we were lucky enough to be shortlisted to five for a paid design competition. Um, we understood that then went down to two and then we were fortunate to be successful towards the end of last year. Again, just to drill into the nature of that project, what we're now doing is a development of that design competition. And what will then happen is that that will be put out to contractors to bid towards the end of this year and they'll be in uh, contracting builders' terms, and we will then stay with our client through to 2026 for the delivery of the project. So you can see, again, uh, certainly from my personal point of view, the project kind of started for me in 2015, if you like, although if not formally, let's call it 2018, and when it finishes in 2026, there's another decade-long project. So it's, it's interesting that uh, certainly if you look at the student forums, the people who you're sitting next to, you probably don't realise that you may well be working with for the rest of your life. 
Um, and some of those connections and collaborations, we think are you know, really important in how you will work in those global networks of how you might connect uh, for future practices and future opportunities. So that's a quick snapshot of some of the projects that the Sydney uh, studio is either currently involved in or has been in recent time. And I think more importantly, the threads and the trends that <clears throat> we're interested in, we think that are important to the various communities that we work in. From a point of view of the industry, some opportunities and challenges um, that I would say to you is that one of those, and this doesn't cover all of them, one of those is that of sustainability and innovation. And as I mentioned, this is the Sustainable uh, Buildings Research Centre at the University of Wollongong. It's the first building in Australia to be recognised in the Living Building Challenge, and I think something like the 23rd in the world and only the third outside of the USA. The key thing here is the long ongoing relationship uh, and, and we're still getting data out of this building about how it works and what it does in fact tip into the system of energy. The building performance therefore is a long going thing that we're uh, interested in understanding. So for us, <clears throat> it's not about finishing a building as an architect, um, shaking hands with your client and saying goodbye. We, we have these long term connections with these people, often repeat clients and understanding things like material selection and how we actually might see that as a research process going forward. That's one end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, we also encourage a lot of our um, team to get involved in things like Vivid. This was a project called Vastitude, which was in Campbell's Cove uh, in 2016, Vivid. And our series of our young designers <clears throat> were working with lighting designers and a contractor to actually achieve this structure, which is in the order you can see in the photo um, of about sort of three odd metres high and about 1.2 by 1.2. The lighting effect here is sensational. And what we've been able to do, we often put in bids for Vivid. Uh, we had one successful for this year, 2020. And as you probably know, that's now been postponed till 2021 for obvious reasons. And in this particular one, we're working with an Indigenous artist and lighting designer called Wagle, and it's a, a rainbow serpent that will be sort of lit up and will be at the base of the steps of the Opera House. So what we find will happen in these experimental projects is we learn things about, um, in this case, the guys learn how to code and they basically took new, you know, in adventures, if you like, on, on doing things that certainly the... Uh, the older people in the practice weren't doing, but by encouraging this sort of experimentality in the practice, it can actually lead to projects back to the Chinese National Maritime Museum, where <clears throat> the technology transfer is really key to how we operate. So when you start to move from freehand lines towards uh, programs such as Rhino and Grasshopper and 3D printing, and then the conversion of those into, if you like, uh, the more conventional delivery methods of Revit and traditional documentation. So our feeling is that you have to make those sort of experiments to uh, find where growth might be able to be uh, found and to look at different ways of actually achieving uh, technology transfer. If I kind of pause <clears throat> for a little bit and take a, a real backward step, if you think about the great uh, architects of the Renaissance, uh, and there are many of, there's two here, Bernese and Palladio, um, obviously, that, that era of architecture, which it was, was really the first recognition of the architect. There are others, Brunelleschi, Borromini, Bernini, etc., all focused around that 15th century um, hive of activity in Europe. Prior to that, what we really saw was building. So it was, you know, building for the masses. In this particular age, it was the, the celebration of the architect, the master architect as well. As then time moved on over the next four or 500 years, you saw the establishment of uh, a series of great visionary architects, two are here that we all know and love, um, Wright and obviously uh, Mies van der Rohe. Um, and there are many others around the world, but they were seen, if you like, as isolationists. Uh, their view was, was sort of very much uh, the own, their own view and they were sort of followed. They were basically sort of disciples in that kind of a sense. Towards the latter part of the 20th century, and indeed probably edging into the, the beginnings of the 21st century, we saw the uh, rise of the star architect. Um, and, you know, again, it was that sort of idea of the, the visionary architect really becoming these sort of, you know, worldwide stars. And heaven forbid if you employed Calatrava to do a building and it didn't look like a Calatrava building. 
um, the pressure must be enormous for these people to create, you know, their sort of rep replicas across the world. And it's, it became a talismanic situation. You know, Sydney has only recently just got its first, first Gary and we all probably as, you know, students uh, flock to it to see, you know, what it's like. So it became a, a trophy sort of a situation in many respects. What Cox is trying to do is to understand how do we work together? How does the creative lab work together? And what it means, as I've mentioned before, to operate in a, an egalitarian and a collaborative situation. So to that end, we see very much, and hopefully you can start to read this thread through our work and our approach, is that our workspaces are egalitarian. Um, the eldest director or the youngest director um, has the same kind of a seat as the person who has just come in uh, for you know, the beginning of their student study. So there's that flatness of structure that we think is fundamental. And as I mentioned, when you work in our office environment, the, the dialogue and the diagram is very flat and very open. Obviously, there are various responsibilities for the roles that occur, but what we're interested in is to try and encourage fresh thinking and different approaches in the way that we work on a daily basis. And we think that our clients enjoy that process as well too, as opposed to being perhaps uh, dictated to on a particular style or an idiom. So to that end, I'm going to show you some fresh thinking here. Um, over the last um, three or four months or so, we've all been through some kind of variety of times, I guess. And um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be asked by the Design Council of Australia to keep a little sketchbook and record some thoughts of what it was like to be uh, in this zone during this period of time. And there's going to be an exhibition towards the end of this year. I think they're, they're looking at a, a series of designers across Australia who they've asked to do the same thing. So from my point of view, um, I kind of contemplated the fact of remoteness. And as I mentioned at the onset, I'm currently on Dirubbin land, which is on the Hawkesbury River at the moment. And so I kind of wondered um, how we would work. And, and we all really questioned when we went into isolation, we sort of thought, well, would it, could it work? Would it work? And we've been certainly lucky with Cox that we've been able to deliver a series of projects that we have at the moment. And there has been a seamlessness and it's because of that collaboration and in many respects, the egalitarianism that we think that people have put their shoulder to the wheel and work together to actually solve the difficulties of being physically apart. So I'm kind of pondering that, you know, potentially smaller, more agile networks is what we'll look to, to sort of achieve a little diagram on the left there could be an architectural practice, it could be a city, uh, it could be a project as well. So I think we need to think about different ways of linking and connecting and communicating. It doesn't have to be, if you like, in the traditional sense where, for example, you get a star architect that tells you what to do. You know, we, we should be working in these really diverse situations and, and looking for collaborations and looking for ways that we can celebrate community. So flexible forms of collaborative work um, and grouping together. How do we get more granular? I think we've all probably in the last four months or so thought about um, the nature of the planet and how perhaps the reduction in carbon use has been good. And how do we actually think on a more community basis as well too? Uh, try and again, back to one of the threads of my architectural thinking, how do we do more with less? So refresh our thinking, don't bounce back to uh, what it was before to actually see this as an opportunity. I think designers can actually play a really key role in understanding where do we go from here? Um, is it business as usual? We don't think so. And certainly, as I mentioned before, one of the director groups that we have in our weekly situation, we've been talking about how do we remodel our workplace? How do we actually make change that can give people a better way of working, can look at a more uh, balanced lifestyle so that people with varying levels of family life or personal lives can, can have those and explore those uh, to their fullest but still achieve the goals that they want to achieve in a work situation and deliver, you know, in this particular case, the design outcomes that we as a, as a studio want to. So we think that our workplace, our Cox Sydney studio and our other studios as well will change and will evolve. And we're going to be trying to influence our clients as well too, that business as usual is not what it used to be, that the things will change. Um, we, we don't have all the answers to that yet, but I guess we're encouraging people to use this sort of time to contemplate and to embrace that change and really, you know, kind of be at the leader and the forefront of how that change might happen, both as a profession and in our particular case as a studio. 
So I would like to thank you. That's a fairly broad ranging view of the world from, uh, from a practice point of view and ending on a place where we may indeed choose to go as a, as a practice and as a profession um, to try and explore really, I guess, a better way of living, a better way of doing the work that we, uh, we, we dearly love so much. So I'm going to hand it back to Adib and Jared for some questions, I think. Thank you so much. That was, that was fantastic. Um, really splendid. And I love the way you um, definitely tied back into history and gave some examples there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go straight into the Q&A. We have a lot of questions. So what I'll try to do is actually group a number of them um, just to make them a bit more coherent and also you know, for time. So the first question we have is, what is the process of winning competitions and competing with other award-winning architecture firms? How can you differentiate your proposal from the others? Are most of the public projects that Cox does won through competitions? Um, <clears throat> there's a real variety. Um, we do try and bracket them to understand where projects come from. One of the great things is a repeat client. So when, um, and certainly as a younger person, one of the, the best things that you can actually do is to do a good job because chances are people, if they enjoy working with you, they'll come back and want to work with you again. So we put a lot of importance on uh, that nature of repeat clientele and, and trying to keep people comfortable. And that doesn't mean that you do every single thing that they say um, that they want you to do because often clients need your professional advice and your professional views. So repeat client is a really important uh, body of work. We spend a lot of time um, trying to understand if we can actually win a project. So I think it's it also is important that as architects, we, I think, uh, often optimists and dreamers and, you know, hey, I'd like to do the world's highest building in the, you know, somewhere, but maybe we don't have the skill sets and maybe to do that, it's a longer term plan you might need to associate with somebody or you might need to go and employ or recruit. So in that sense where you don't necessarily have that repeat clientele situation, you then need to look at ways that you can actually start to um, maybe put your brand together with somebody else. And we've done that and you take that sort of critical analysis and we've just done a competition in Sydney, unfortunately unsuccessful, um, but we, we what we in Cox represented was the local knowledge, the approach towards Sydney, the understanding, deep understanding of context and Australia, and our partner brought in that high rise expertise just as one example. So I think that was a competitive situation. Um, so there are many, many ways of winning a project. Um, the repeat clientele is probably the best. We always say there's a bit of an unwritten rule. If you hear about a project, let's say in some kind of an advertisement um, or on a notification, if you didn't know about it, you probably shouldn't be bidding for it. So a little bit like my Western Sydney Airport analogy, we knew that project was coming for four or five years. So that gives you the time to prepare, whether that's in a competition or whether that's just to, to get yourself organised to actually bid for it. Maybe it's only a solo fee situation, but getting shortlisted is often a complex situation where you'll have to maybe go and talk to the client beforehand and present your credentials, express that you'd like to be a part of it, present your credentials and convince them that they'll put you on a short list because um, certainly what the likes of my generation has seen is that uh, at the at the beginning of my career, architects were probably appointed from that city. Now what we're seeing is architects are appointed from anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. So, you know, the world is the, the choice that that big clients have. So you need to be aware of what's available and what's on offer. And I think also be aware of what your particularities are, what you're good at. And you can't always be good at everything. So try and be really good at the things that you are good at. So thanks for that. Um, the next question we have is, how is the work divided between people with the same job titles? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, usually what will happen is that somebody or a group of, of bodies will pursue a project uh, from, from its early onset. And hopefully if they are pursuing it and if they're successful, they have the skill sets to deliver it. So, uh, you know, for example, as I mentioned and I've articulated, a few of the projects that are there are projects that I'm lucky enough to be working on. 
Um, others with the same skill set could do similar projects as well too, but I guess it's about it's about that sort of pursuit. And we definitely have a role where if if a team starts on a project, they finish a project. So we're very keen on that to ensure that people <clears throat> get that continuity whole of life situation. So um, I think it really comes back to, you know, within our practice, people have a have a very wide range of interests. I mean, I'm particularly intrigued by public realm and urban design and transport. Um, others are equally intrigued by housing and doing, you know, multi-density housing. So um, you develop those particular skill sets and I guess they focus on those aspects. Awesome, awesome. So um, I guess one of the more repeating questions that we get, especially from students, so I'm gonna try and bulk all of these together is, um, what kind of advice do you have for students who are aspiring and trying to enter the workforce do things like the weighted average mark or um, which university you've graduated from matter that much um, to an employer? Um, I think the weighted average mark is important. It's, it's also the, <clears throat> if you like, the passion. I always say you've got to be passionate about something, um, in, in certainly in architecture. And the way that average mark is a really important thing because I, I think it's you, it makes it harder to succeed if you don't have a good one. It doesn't have to be the highest. It doesn't have to be perfect. But I think you have to be passionate about some things, even in your earliest parts of your career. I, I stumbled across a paper that I wrote at university some 30-odd years ago where I was going on about uh, the importance of, of public and private space. So even back then, you know, I was intrigued by by how public place was made. So I think you've got to understand the things that you're really keen on. And what's so wonderful about architecture is that it's such a broad church. It can be everything from, you know, you might be intrigued by brickwork, you might be intrigued by public place making, you might be intrigued by writing specifications. It doesn't matter. Just be passionate about it and give it your all. And I think that that will be unmistakable. I think that certainly in the case of an employer, um, we see those things, you know, and it's a, it, it then sort of bounces out of you. Uh, and it, it flows through to, you know, the quality of books that you're reading, the films that you're seeing, those kind of issues as well too. So it's that um, don't be told to fit in a box. You know, if there's something that you're really passionate about, pursue it, I think. And, and again, the architectural world is so broad that there's so many different lines and levels to be able to be pursued. So, um, you know, I think you've just got to find what that is and, and experiment around, certainly in the younger realms, experiment as much as you possibly can. And you'll find things that you keep getting attracted back to. And they're the ones that um, in architectural senses that I think you should try and pursue. Wonderful, yeah. Um, I think the next leading on question would be, uh, which is more specific to um, Cox is, What's the typical hiring process, um, you know, and subsequent progression of an architectural graduate joining? Uh, I think yeah, it's it, it is interesting because we um, <clears throat> we do go through a particular process. We we'll want to see people's CVs. We'll always do two interviews, and the second and sometimes third of those um, will be a couple of people. And the the if you like the the handle that they have on the lever is about that sort of cultural fit. So a lot of the things that I've talked about here, um, this presentation has been one that, that has been put together with myself and another one of the directors, and we've sort of chipped it together and oscillated it together over a few years um, as a templative form. Uh, but what that starts to do is to do a cultural story. And if we just find about being honest and frank with people that they don't fit the cultural purpose, um, it's really not worth pursuing whether whether in, we, we might be in need for somebody but unless the cultural fit is there from our point of view and we would say from a student's point of view, you should be interviewing your potential employer as much as we're interviewing you. Um, getting that cultural fit right is really important. So I'd say the first interview uh, is important. We'll often give people, if that's their particular ilk, a Revit test. And then, then there's that subsequent minimum second interview, sometimes a third that's very much about cultural fit and you know how does that sort of work out. Um, because it's, to be frank, it's easy to get people on board if the fit's not right, but it's really hard to undo those things um, because we've all made, you all make various commitments of coming to work and it's difficult. So, you know, choosing a workplace is a really important thing and you do need to 
contemplate the choreography of how you wish to work. Some students think about, well, I might work in a large practice for a while and then I might pursue a small practice. Um, others might want to pursue registration. And you mentioned at the onset that I'm a um, New South Wales Architectural Registration Board examiner. And that's kind of interesting because one of the misnomers that younger students and, and architects think that you can't get registered if you're working in a large practice. And we, we and other large practices have put a lot of energy into dispelling that. And it's about the kind of expertise that you have and how that expertise gets applied in a broad uh, realm. So I guess, you know, understanding what are you looking to try and achieve as a younger architect is important. It may be registration. It probably should be registration as one of the key things, but it just should also be a diversity of experience and, and also to just contemplate that time goes by so quickly and that's kind of why I put that timeline up in my particular situation because sooner or later you'll find that you might do two or three projects that you are enjoying and you might be on a career path and the next thing you know 30 years have kind of you know gone so be careful in your choices I would say. Um, There's one there I can see on the screen which I'll answer I'll just pick it out. Yeah. Um, why do a master of urban design rather than a master of architecture? And I, I'd have to say to you, I probably at the time really didn't uh, discern that much of the difference, but I thought urban design sounded really interesting. So this was the era when Jan Gell and others were really uh, putting some flesh on the bones of urban design. And it kind of opened my world. I, I felt that I had a good training as an architect and I was a registered architect, but to then learn about urbanity um, for me, really opened my eyes completely about understanding how cities grow. And I, I felt sort of looking back at it embarrassed uh, that the architectural experience I had really lacked that understanding of how cities are made and how um, how society works in cities. So um, I'm very pleased that I did an urban design as a, as a second degree. And I think it influences the way you make architecture as well, back to what I was saying. The notion of you know you know Sydney being our project that's how we think about things always from the macro and then pull it down to the micro. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see um, people go off into different kind of categories that are you know core to the built environment. So it's good to maintain that multidisciplinary characteristic in a um, in our workforce. Um, so I might skip over a couple of questions since um, you know there's quite a lot. Uh, so with people like Mary Oxman pushing material concepts, what is Cox's position on exploring similar concepts and utilizing this in future developments in say the next five to ten years? Um, yeah, I mean we're always intrigued by new materials and new systems and. And that doesn't always come from us. That can come with, um, you know, bumping around into collaborators as well too. We've we've been lucky enough to just finish the new tennis tennis centre uh, in Homebush, and there was a particular series of program events that they wanted to put a roof over the tennis centre. Didn't have a roof, and so they were struggling with attendance and and uh, spectator comfort. So we worked with an organisation that does really lightweight uh, tensile fabric structures over, over, you know, roof forms. And they were wonderful. They brought to us, you know, a true collaborative sense that achieved some really quite onerous time conditions, but we felt also it was able to achieve the, the beauty and the lightness of space making and, and place making that we were after as well. So I think it's having an open palette to all of those um, approaches that, you don't necessarily know all the answers, but if you have um, an approach that might let others in in a collaborative sense, that that's what becomes, you know, truly important. I think that listening to getting good collaborators and listening to good collaborators, um, and then hopefully what we can bring to that discussion is the the various um, realms we've got, which range from wisdom uh, to new technologies. Um, I love this question, this next question. Um, what was a failure that you experienced as a director in Cox Architecture that later set you up for success, a blessing in disguise? Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, one that springs to mind, I think, is learning <clears throat> when you're writing things like fee letters or reviewing contracts. 
and luckily touch wood in in my situation uh everyone you do write a fee letter there's things called inclusions and exclusions and trying to get scope right so you tend not to make those mistakes very often and what we do very much is we we review those so it's never up to one person to issue if you like a contractual document um so we always have multiple sets of eyes on there but inevitably there are small things that happen that you uh, you may leave in you may leave out interpretive you know it's every project is really complex about uh what the client's assumptions are and you know contracts are getting more and more um uh you know difficult to understand difficult to interpret so i think that definition of scope is a constant thing that we, we talk about on a daily basis that clients want more everybody wants more um and we have to be really clear about what's written into our arrangements and uh you know how we actually define those if you like that's an organizational one i think failure otherwise sometimes and we do do this as architects is when things happen and often projects are linked to program and you'll just have a quiet look at a detail sometimes and you sort of think to yourself well i may have been able to to do that a little better or that maybe able to work that junction a little a little better so i think that's wisdom as well not necessarily a failure and it's not as if the building's going to fall down but you know we all have various ideals about how architecture can be made and crafted and i think uh, nobody's ever stood in front of a perfect building and I think every time that you go and see, especially one of your own works, you always see things in it that could have been different. Uh, you know, and it, it might be, maybe it rests on your shoulders. Maybe it was something that either wasn't coordinated correctly or just time pressure, you know, made it that couldn't happen. But I think that, I think that self-effacing, hopefully, view uh, and being inter interrogative always means that there's room to grow. You know, I could have done that brick joint a little bit better. I could have done that steel joint a little bit better as well too. So I think constantly having that view uh, is a good thing. When you go going and looking at your own buildings is a really hard thing to do because you often, you see you, you see all the memory processing there and you do have to celebrate the good, but there are always things in there that you think you maybe could have done differently or better. Um, so the next one is, um... Sorry if I, apologies if I skip over your question again um, due to time. Uh, does Cox incorporate or prioritize sustainable design into most projects? If so, would employees having knowledge in sustainability be an advantage or does Cox simply outsource this aspect to other consultants? Um, we do do both. <clears throat> I think most every project we have probably has a, um, a sustainability consultant of some sort and um, we think that there's a value in that we it's, it's actually a topic that we're, we're having at the moment is that we want to try and increase the knowledge of sustainability across our broader practice and across the youth of our practice as well so that it becomes ingrained in the daily um, discussion uh, it's something that in our collection of material is really primary so we do put a lot of energy and effort into trying to understand the entropy of a material, where does it come from, how is it made, uh, what's the meaning, um, from origin to basically finding its way on the site. So I think the answer is it could always be better, and that's back to what I was saying about the um, uh, University of Wollongong building, is that we are interested in finding out all that information and tipping it back into our day-to-day -day work as well too. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a complex and ongoing discussion that we're having with, with people, but our view is that we want to try and make it that a lot more of our younger people are adept at having those discussions and, and, and appreciating the, I guess, the use of materials. We that's, that's kind of where we often start at. It's how we use materials and how we use systems within buildings economically. Um, another one to make you really think... <laughs> What is one small change that you aren't implementing right now, but you would like to implement right now to make a big impact on Cox Architecture? Yeah. What, would, what would it be and why? Uh, we're having lots of discussions at the moment about research and what does that look like? And it's, it's uh, again, it's another really broad topic. We have an embedded um, uh, doctorate student from UTS within our practice at the moment, which is a first both for UTS and certainly a first for Cox. So what happens is that that student spends a couple of days at UTS and a couple of days at Cox, and they're pursuing uh, the role of transit-oriented developments in Sydney as their as their doctoral thesis. So 
it's for us we don't really know what we'll get out of it but we think that the experiment is worthwhile and i think from uts's point of view um they have a probably a similar kind of a view but it's our figuring was that we we want to try and do more of that kind of research as well too so um for us it's is it research with others is it research within the practice is it research on what topic um so for us we think that that's a something that we maybe even as an industry but we certainly feel that we can always do more and try and pursue more um so you know we're interested in everything from uh just material selections as well too you know the nature of material selections and how they're used as well as that that example that i've used there which is more of a you know an abstract design situation so i think that we it's a, that's the itch that almost can't be scratched is how do we better research and try and tip that back into our um, daily project thinking. This next question is um, a good one for you because I know that you're an author and passionate about drawing and um, visual expression and visual arts. So what are your thoughts on architecture being conveyed through the more imaginative or graphic means and how do they hold up to renderings? Is the marrying of these two forms of visualization something that's practiced and utilized here at Cox? Yeah, well, there's this obsession with um, computer-generated imagery, isn't there? And, and, you know, they're truly accurate and experiential now with um, VAR as well, too. And, and, you know, we're doing what we can to be in that place and to try and, you know, lead in some areas there as well as far as experiencing architecture as you go as a sort of a learning uh, interpretive sort of situation. So... I think that that's, that's almost the next direction is that people, as you can see, if you'll be able to, you know, have the goggles on and, and really sort of see the work live. Uh, it's, it's here. It's not on every project for us and it's not probably required on every project, but certainly on the major projects, we do do that and have the ability to do full 3D walkthroughs. So we're finding that our clients pretty much demand that these days. That's seen as that's been turning up for natural business sort of thing. That's not necessarily anything special anymore. Um, so the technology that goes with that, again, is something that you know you might be passionate about and you can learn, and that can be your particular area of expertise. And it's valuable, really valuable. Um, when you talk about representation, uh, you know, I think when you look at realms and you know we like many other practices are on all of this sort of um, public social media forms as well and I think you almost have to do all of that it was quite interesting on Friday night with the New South Wales Australian Institute of Architects Awards I think uh, highly likely for the first time ever um, not in person so you know obviously conveyed digitally I thought it was a success in many respects so it shows you that as have the last four months that things can be done in different ways. So you don't have to rely on ways to do things. You know, events change the uh, things that we thought were standard and stayed. I love books, but I also appreciate that there's different ways that uh, communication can be conveyed and stored for sure. So what I'll do now is uh, we'll wrap up with two more questions, um, if you don't yep. mind. And the, the first question is one that I'm also asking personally as I'm trying to expand my library. Um, I've invested in a number of different architectural books. What is one book that has been significant in broadening your understanding of architecture in a specific way or as a whole? Um, <clears throat> one of my favourite ones is a book by an author called A.E. Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, and it's called something like the history of urban form up until the Industrial Revolution. And it's a beautiful quarto-sized book and it has wonderful little side notes uh, in it. And it just talks about the origin of the city, as the name would suggest, up until um, the Industrial Revolution. And for me, uh, reading it, I remember uh, falling into the book and it, you know, it sort of starts in ancient Turkey and, and ancient Chinese cities and through the Greeks and the Romans and then moves its way right through and, you know, gives you all these great factual accounts of uh, what urban life is. So for me, that's a really sensible and serious one. Um, I also think that the... I also like reading fiction in a sense where you imagine architecture as well. So, you know, for mine, I like the Australian 
particularly West Australian author Tim Winton, because when he writes, I and I don't know Western Australia particularly well, but when he writes, I'm in that forest that he's describing, or I'm on that beach, or you know, when he talks about urban situations as well. So that I think it's great to also read fiction in that sense because it can paint those pictures that uh, you imagine. So I think you've kind of got to do both. I had for a long time I would read. Uh, in alternating fashion, one book on architecture and urban design and then quite, quite deliberately one not uh, as a different thing. And I, I think that kind of helps to um, move your thinking around a little bit. Mm. Definitely. Um, I'll wrap up with the last question of the bunch. Is there a culture for foraging good ideas? Is it possible for a student to have the lead idea on a competition if it is the best idea? Is there a chance to hear their voice on a comp? For example, are there internal competitions for ideas for projects where we are all heard? Yeah, it's interesting. The <clears throat> late English architect James Sterling sort of made famous the quote, um, what's the big idea? And he sort of he delivered that when he was talking to university students because often when you're young, you're... You know, you're telling your jury about all the difficulties you had in assembling the project and, you know, why you're up so late and why you're late and all that kind of stuff as well too. And he sort of quite famously came out and said, what's the big idea? And I think that's important. The question would be in, in an architecture that we live in now, is it enough to have one big idea is, is, or one idea? Maybe what you need is, a, you know, a... a, a a formation or series of thoughts that come together and that set of attitudes and you can hopefully see from what I've talked about tonight which is talking about a practice there are many many uh, threads and thoughts that kind of weave together and on some projects some of those thoughts will make more noise than others and on other projects you'll have other elements that will become more important so I think to contemplate that there's one idea might be um, slightly misleading. I, I, I would encourage people to, I guess, again, develop a series of things that they think are important and you find on people's projects develop through your career that in some cases you'll be able to apply something that maybe, you know, has a really has a real strength in one of those, uh, but the next project might be a strength in another of those. So, yeah, I think it is important to look <clears throat> for clarity. Um, I'll often start a presentation with a client um, to tell them that we're going to do, we're going to talk about three key things. Um, and we'll often try and distill that in our work um, that you might say, and it doesn't matter whether there's four or there's five, but I often just use three. And it just distills people thinking, people's thinking, and it distills your thinking as well too, to try and clarify and articulate, you know, your particular um, mode of purpose, I think is the important thing, the student especially. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I want to thank you again very much for presenting today, um, especially with the time constraint. You definitely tackled a number of um, really interesting topics, and you know I, I really look forward to future discussions and future collaborations between the University of New South Wales Architecture Society and I, and Cox Architecture. So I'd like to now pass it on to Jared um, for some announcements. Thanks, Adib. And yes, thanks, David. Um, just another thanks, especially from an architecture student's perspective, to get some first sort of insights into such an incredibly large international company and just some, you know, the insight into how they structure that and how you work, how you create that ethos, and your personal insights during that Q&A was incredible too. I'm sure we've all come away with a, with a lot tonight. Um, if it's all right, I'd just like to make a couple of announcements on behalf of the Architecture Society. So for those of you who don't know, the Architecture Society is a student-run and student-led society within New, New, the University of New South Wales um, for the students. We put together, we create spaces for our students to come together. We bring the industry to them, such as talks like this. Um, for our members, I just want to remind you all that we have our live stream this Friday afternoon for the quarantine design competition. Um, so make sure you check our Facebook to find the link for that. Um, you can go to our website, interuniversitydesign.com, 
and you can have a look at the gallery there. And we also have our InDesign workshop coming up next Monday night as well. Make sure you stick around for those. Um, David, thank you again. Um, is there any way or any particular links that people can reach Cox Architecture? Um, I, well, we're always happy to talk to people. So I guess both there's the EP Cox contacts that are there. Um, there's our website and, you know, I think, you know, a lot of our directors and, and people generally are always happy to try and, you know, talk. And I think we, we engage a lot with universities through tutoring and other forms as well too. So, yeah, I mean, we're obviously happy to you know, have these kind of discussions and hope that they are of interest and, you know, benefit people. So, yeah, we, we, but we find it, it's just as interesting when we hear things from you as well too. So, um, We've just done a, a situation with uh, Western Sydney University, which has a new architecture degree. And we've actually got them to critique some of the work that we're doing on the Western Sydney airport as well. And it was it was really interesting and, and helpful to have that. So two-way streets are really important. It's not just a didactic situation for sure. Yeah, no, we really appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll continue this relationship with students uh, from relationship in the future. Um, so yes, and again, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, but otherwise, that is that is it for tonight. I'd just like to say thank you guys for organising and for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and I think it's a great organisation you've got. And you know, keep up the uh, sharing of knowledge. It's very impressive. So thanks for thanks for listening from my point of view. Yes, Thank you again. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Good night. Good night.